It is wonderful to be here uh, and, and to, to be here to worship among you and lead as well. Uh, thank you so much to Jim for your welcome. Thank you to everybody for standing. That, that feels very strange uh, as well as uh, in Tartarhan there was the reverend on the screen. Of who, who is that? Uh, who's there? But um, thank you to everyone for your welcome. Thank you to everyone uh, who was able to make it on Friday evening for the installation, the ordination service. Uh, it was a, a, a lovely evening. Uh, thank you to everyone over the last couple of weeks as well for those who've welcomed us into the area, who've helped us move in, who've lifted our stuff and moved it into the manse. Also those who've called around with cards or, or food. Uh, we've really been made to feel so welcome. Um, Lauren will be up from, from Tartarhan in, uh, shortly and so uh, she wanted to tell me that to extend that to you as well. Uh, and as I do start, you'll be able to see the, the contact details for me are on the announcement sheet. We don't have a landline number yet, but um, once we get that sorted, we'll, we'll let you know what that is. And as, as I do begin, uh, please do forgive me if uh, I, I, get, I have to ask your name a couple of times or, or if I get it wrong. Uh, there's quite a few of you. There's only one of me and we will get there, I promise. Um, and, and so there's a, been a sea of faces and sea of names for the last while, but I'm looking forward to getting to know each and every one of you more uh, over this ministry as well. And so I, I was to highlight a number of announcements that, of things going on. Uh, firstly, just the, uh, the first one is, hopefully you were able to pick up some of the, uh, the cards for the carol service that have been published. These are a really good invitation for the carol service on the 15th of December uh, to give out to those who you know. It's a great opportunity to invite those who maybe are in the periphery of church or who maybe aren't familiar with us to, to come and be a part of us for that evening as we sing carols, as we hear God's word together. And so uh, you would be very uh, welcome, but also give these cards to those um, who, who you encounter as well. And then just on that, there will be a choir practice this afternoon at, at 4.15 here uh, for, the, for the carol service, and it would be great for you to join through that as well. And then Zoom prayer meeting is going to be tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., and you can find the login details on the announcement sheet. And so can I encourage you just as we begin the working week, as we begin this new season of ministry, uh, to log on to, to that 7 a.m. It's a great way to start the week. Um, as we meet together to come before the Lord in prayer. Um, also then let me highlight the, the Wednesday evening midweek meeting in, in the Coop schools. Those have been happening over the last number of weeks. This Wednesday is the final one of those on door-to-door -door evangelism. So that's 8 p.m. in the Coop school. It would be really good to see you there. But if you're unable to attend in person, there will be a Zoom link available and you can receive that too. And then on Thursday evening, we're going to be having our congregational get-together, um, and so that's going to be supper uh, at 6.45 here in the church. Hopefully, you've been able to sign up for that and get sorted for that. I think the sign-ups are, are closed at this point, um, but it's looking, really, really looking forward to that evening. Um, also then, an advance announcement for Tuesday week. Um, the Armagh Academy is going to be meeting again on the 10th of December, and the Reverend Dr. Sinclair Ferguson, who uh, is, you may be familiar with in his teaching from Ligonier online um, and in various different places, he's going to be coming over to speak on what the Reformed believe about the Holy Spirit. Sinclair's written a number of books on the Holy Spirit. He's going to be there, and it's a great privilege to hear him speak on the topic. So let me encourage you to put that in your diary and to come along and first pour it down for that on what the Reformed believe on the Holy Spirit. Then this is our gift Sunday for the Belfast City Mission. And so we're really grateful for, uh, for those who have helped to uh, direct the, uh, the tree, for Sandra, Carol, and the CE for setting that up and decorating it as well. Um, and I want to invite the, the children now, if you want to come up with your, your gifts that are going to be put under the tree, you can do that now. And I'll receive them. Uh, and then, yeah. So if you have gifts, do you want to bring them up now? Thank you so much. Do you want to put it on, Ricky? That's great. Good job. Oh. 
amazing. Here, you go around here with those. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for all your contributions to, to that appeal for the Belfast City Mission. Um, thank you to Gladys for also running those up to, to Belfast this week um, as, as she helps and transports those to the Belfast City Mission as those go towards children who are in need at this time of year. Uh, we're going to be praying for that appeal and for the Belfast City Mission later on in our service. And, I, and, and so as we come to worship now, um, we're going to be called by God's Word. It's the same reading that we had on Friday night as we came to worship. Um, but we're going to hear the words of Psalm 100 together, which tell us this. It's a psalm for giving thanks. It says this, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. As we think about these words, let's respond as we stand in praise to God, as we sing two songs, his mercy is more, and love divine, all love's excelling. Let's stand as we praise God together.
as we've sung God's praise, let's come to him now in prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, we gather here this morning as your people in this place to worship you for who you are and for all that you have done for us. Lord, when we consider even a fragment of who you are, we are amazed. For you are Alpha and Omega, you are beginning and end, you are the uncreated one. There is no one before you and no one who will be after you. But yet from your fullness you have created our entire cosmos. All that we know has come into being. Not as we go outside and look up on these darker nights, we see stars that you have hung into space. Lord, your word tells us that the heavens declare your glory. And when we consider them, we are in awe of you. For just as our brightest and best scientists take their greatest telescopes and probe the depths of the night sky, only glimpsing just a fragment of what exists there, In the same way, as we come to you, we can only comprehend just a fragment of who you are. Yet you're the one who reigns sovereignly and majestically over all things, both those things that we see and those things that we do not. Nothing is outside of your control, and so we adore you. But Lord, we also confess that while you have created all things and you reign over them, that we have... As we have already sung, our sins are many. Lord, we confess that we have tried to make ourselves the gods of our lives. We've tried to place ourselves in the throne that only you alone are are eligible to occupy. Lord, we have tried to exalt ourselves when only you deserve our worship. Lord, even this week we've forgotten about who you are and we've sought our own glory and good above your kingdom. Forgive us, Lord. Yet we praise you as we remember what you have done for us at this time of year as we've already sung. We praise you that you have sent your own love, your son, into this world, descended for us. Lord, we thank you that because of him we can be forgiven and reconciled to you because of his death on the cross and his resurrection for us. We thank you that while his right, uh, that he is now in his rightful place, seated at your throne in heaven, after he has humbled himself by taking on our flesh and our frailties, bearing our, our sin and shame and dying in our place that we might live. Lord, we thank you as we come into this Advent season that we can celebrate this good news that we have in that nativity scene as your son comes to earth. Lord, we pray that you would teach us to follow Christ more. Help us to know that the way of your gospel is opposite to the way of this world. Lord, while the world would seek to exalt itself, help us to see that true life is found by dying to self, taking our cross and following your son. Lord, while the world seeks the good of each individual, help us to see that our ultimate good is found when we give ourselves to following in your ways and being part of your church. Lord, may we become more like Christ in every way. For it's in his name we come and in his name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to God's Word now. And uh, this morning we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. Um, the, the way the services are working in these couple of weeks, it's throwing some things out of kilter a little bit. And so this morning we're going to start with a, a one-off passage this week. And then next week here we're going to begin a, a new series in John's Gospel. And so this week we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, in this really wonderful and famous passage that tells us about all that Jesus has done for us. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read from verses 1 to 11. As we read, we remember that this is God's living and active word which speaks to us this afternoon and says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. 
Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Boys and girls, do you want to come up to the front? And I, I want to talk to you for a few moments there about what we just read. All right, good morning, everybody. All right. Do you want a high five? No, completely blanked. That's all right. <laughs> good morning, everybody. How are we all? Good, bad. Do you want me to give you, a, I'll give you all high fives there. There we go. All right. Yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Completely missed there. Ah. There we go. I love you, jumper. That's a great jumper. Right. It's lovely to see you. I, I am looking forward to getting to know you a bit more, and I really want to get your names as well. And so I'm going to ask you a, a question this morning. As you know, we've just moved here, okay? And so all of our stuff is packed in boxes, uh, all, of our, all of our fun stuff. But sometimes I, and maybe Nathaniel as well, like to maybe dress up as something. I, you see Marvel jumper here, but I wonder if you could tell me what things I would need to buy if I was to dress up like a king, okay? I think you're acting it out, okay? Is it one of these? A crown. Good job, Nathaniel. Remind me of your name again. What's your name? Lucas. Lucas. Thank you so much, Lucas. Okay, so the first thing, I don't just run around the house. The man's dressed up like a king, I promise. Okay, but, but the first thing I would need if I wanted to have a king outfit would be a crown. Okay, what other things would I need apart from a crown if I was to dress up like a king? Yes. A cape like a, a robe, like a big, long red robe that I can go around the house. Yeah, doesn't that sound good, Nathaniel? Yes. Okay, remind me of your name again as well. I, Isla? Yes. So we have Lucas and we have Isla. Okay, thank you so much. So we need a big cape. What other things do I need if I was to dress up like a, a king? Isla. Yes. Nathaniel, you tell me, what, what would I need? So we've got a crown and we've got a cape. Big stick. Big stick. big stick. Yes. I would need one of those, like a scepter. There's something that shows how powerful I am as I walk around the house. Again, not doing this. This is in the figure of imagination, okay? So I've got my crown, I've got my robe, I've got my, my big stick, okay? Is there anything else that I need? Yes. Yes, what? I maybe need to look. What, sorry? Sandals. Sandals is a, yeah, we could go for sandals, okay. Sandals would be a really good choice. But So we've got the robe and we've been looking all smart. Maybe some, some jewelry, some, uh, some fancy rings and things like that. that. That's kind of what we imagine when we think about a king. And so thank you so much. I'm going to go to Argos this week and we can order a, a crown, probably a weak plastic one, and a, a cape or a robe and, and, and all those things. And then whenever we play dress up, then we can dress up. And Nathaniel, I'll get you one as well. And we can, we can dress up in that way as well. But I wonder, as we think about that passage, does that tell us about, we hear about King Jesus, yeah. King Jesus, but actually the picture that we have of a king isn't the picture of somebody with a crown who maybe sits on a throne. Maybe I need to buy one of those as well. Yes, that's all right. Jesus. It is Jesus. Yes, absolutely. So it's not the picture of, of somebody who has a, a crown and a throne and a robe and all that, but actually the Bible tells us that Jesus, the true king, he doesn't do all these things to make himself look amazing and better, but actually it tells us that he, even though he sits in the throne in heaven, he humbles himself. Yeah. Does anybody know what it means to humble yourself? That's a big word, okay? <laughs> do you want to give it a go? What? 
he did rise from the dead, and that's really good news. But, but actually, it means that, it means that you, you make yourself lower. It means that you put yourself down, that you don't uh, do all the things that make you higher, but you actually go lower, and so you humble yourself. Okay, and so Jesus actually, instead of having all those things that a king can have, that we rightfully can say that belong to him, the, the power and the glory and the throne and everything like that, we're told, and as we're coming into this time of year, we're told that Jesus doesn't do those things, but actually he humbles himself and he comes to earth. He come, becomes like us in every way and he humbles himself. He becomes just like a baby. And instead of being in a palace like kings can be, we're told he goes to a stable. Isn't that the story we're going to hear all through Christmas? Yeah. Yes. It's the story we're going to hear about all through Christmas. Instead of being in a palace with a crown, he's born in a, in a stable. And he humbles himself for us. And that's, that's a reminder that, that all that we do, okay, all that we do is as we focus on him, as we have our faith in him, we are to humble ourselves and follow his example and, and look for, out for the needs of other people because Jesus came into this world and he came for us to, to care for us and to forgive us from our sins as well, to go to the cross and then to go to the grave and to rise again as well. And so that's a reminder for us that while we can think of kings as people with crowns and, and robes, Jesus shows us that the true king is someone who humbles himself and comes into this world, not into a big fancy palace, but into a humble stable. We're going to stand and we're going to sing and you guys can head back to your, your families as we can, as we're going to stand and sing from heaven you came, helpless babe. Let's
as we think about bringing our lives as a daily offering, we're going to now bring our, our offering here for this Sunday morning, and so our offering will now be received. children head out, we're going to come to God together again in prayer um, as we dedicate our offering, as we bring the, the needs of our congregation and the wider world to, to God as well. Let's pray together. Um, let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we give you thanks this afternoon that you have sustained us. Lord, as we each Sit here, you have provided for us what we need. Lord, your word tells us that from you has been given life and breath and everything. And so we come from homes that have roofs over our heads, that have food on the table. Lord, we give you thanks this morning for all of your provision to us, whether much or little. And Lord, as we give you thanks, we also dedicate our offering to you. Lord, as we bring back a portion of what you have first given to us in faith, asking that you would take it, that you would use it, that you would multiply it for the work of your kingdom, both here in this congregation and throughout your world. Lord God, as we pray for our world, we also bring to you its many, many needs. Lord, you know fully the things that burden our hearts as we watch our news cycles, as we think about the world around us. Lord, we bring to you the Middle East this morning, as we see news of another conflict brewing in Syria and another diff difficult situation, Lord, we pray for wisdom for leaders in that country. Lord, we know that it is a country which has a persecution of your people there. And Lord, we pray for your people in that land that you would sustain them, that you would uphold them, that you would give them a boldness for the gospel, even in this change of circumstances and these difficult days. Lord, may they be light in the midst of darkness in that place. Lord, we also pray for the other conflicts that are around the Middle East, Lord, as we still know, that even going on in the background, that there is the conflict with Israel and Gaza. Lord, we thank you for uh, steps forward with certain ceasefires with other nations, but we pray that you would, even after this year and a, a bit more, would bring that conflict to an end, not just with a temporary peace, but with a more lasting peace that would allow people to rebuild their lives. Lord, we pray for your people in both Israel and Gaza as well this morning. Lord, we pray that you would be with them as they meet together. Lord, that you would sustain them in all that has been going on in these months. Lord, that you would give confidence to the leaders of your church and that through their teaching that you would be building up your people that they would be like a city on a hill that is not easily hidden, but they would stand firm for you even in these days. Lord God, as we look to the world around us, we also look closer to home. Lord, we pray for the, the Irish election happening in the Republic this, this week. Lord, we hear the news reports that it is too close to call, that the, the vote seems to reflect a nation that is going in different directions. Lord, we pray that even at this time that you would be raising up the leaders who will take their seats in the Doyle. 
Lord, we pray that you would be uh, help through this election, helping an, a door to open even more for the gospel in, in the Republic, one of the most unreached people groups in Europe for the evangelical gospel. Lord, we pray that you would be with your leaders in churches in the Republic of Ireland in these days, that they would help your people to think through uh, how to vote and, and what ways to vote and how to live out their faith in their day in that land. Lord, we also pray for our own nation this week as we've heard of the, the vote being passed even at the initial stage of, of the assisted suicide bill. Lord, we know that you have you're the one who creates life from its very beginning and its conception to its very end. You're the one who numbers our days. Lord, as your people, as we see the value of life, we mourn this, this, this bill passing, but we know it is a very sensitive issue for so many, especially those who are suffering themselves or, or caring for those who are suffering. Lord, we pray even in these days as the bill is revised, as it goes to other houses for debate, that uh, you would... Uh, seek to, to bring that bill to a stop as it, it would go through. Lord, we pray for those organizations, those Christian charities that are working with people throughout, uh, throughout the, the government as they advocate for the Christian values in those places. We pray for the likes of the Christian Institute and Evangelical Alliance. We pray that you would give them wisdom as they work in the public square. But Lord, we also pray that as your people, you would give us wisdom. Give us wisdom in how to talk with others, especially those who are suffering in this time. Lord, give us wisdom in how uh, we seek to show the value that you have placed on each life, regardless of illness or infirmity or circumstances. Lord, we pray for those who are in our NHS, who are working in the medical field, or as they have even more pressure put on them to be involved in these sorts of procedures. Lord, we pray that you will be giving them wisdom in how to act and how to engage with their colleagues and also their patients, especially as they administer end-of-life care. Lord, we pray for those who are also in care homes and work with those who are older or infirm or housebound. Again, we pray that you would help them treat every person with dignity that they deserve because they are made in your image. Lord, again, give us wisdom as we seek to work through these issues in our own lives. And Lord, we pray for us as a congregation in this new season of ministry that has just begun. Lord, we pray that you would be among us by your Holy Spirit, working in us as your word is preached each and every week. Lord, we bring our, our leaders to you. Lord, we bring our elders, members of session, members of committee as well, as they seek to... Uh, to lead us both spiritually in terms of the session and also practically in terms of the committee. Lord, we pray that you will give wisdom in each decision that has to be made. Lord, we pray for those who serve in various areas in church. Lord, for those who lead our youth programs as, and our children's programs as they go out even now to, to work with our young children, as they seek to share the gospel with them and see them grow up in the faith. Lord, we pray that again you would be at work among us. Grow us as deep disciples of your son Jesus, that we would seek to live for him in every area of life. And now, Lord, as we come to your word, we give you thanks as we remember that it is a double-edged sword for us. As we spend time in this passage, we pray that like a skilled surgeon by your spirit, you would cut out of us any of the sin that binds and blinds us to your glory and divides us from one another. Lord, we pray that by these cuts that we may be truly healed and become more like your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that as we consider him, that we would be challenged to love and follow him in every moment of life and love and, and cherish one another. Lord, be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles there, would you open them back to Philippians chapter 2, as we're going to be spending our, our time, uh, the remaining time in this passage this morning, or this afternoon. need to get that, that right as we come up the road. Uh, it seems like it's a time change. Um, but this afternoon feels like a bit of a, a cross-section in church life. It's pretty mild outside, but you may not realize that it is the first Sunday of Advent, 
Christmas is coming. It is coming very quickly. You've got your carol service invitations. And as we come to this Sunday, we're also starting this new season of congregational life in ministry. And we need to wonder what God is speaking to us, what he is saying as we think about the gift that he has given to us in Jesus as he comes down this time of year and also as we're seeking to start this new phase of life as a church family. And we also have our gift service this morning for the Belfast City Mission, and so we remember that too. And as I said earlier, we're normally going to be working through books of the Bible, uh, but for this Sunday, we're going to be turning to this wonderful passage in Philippians, in Paul's letter here. And Lord willing, we're going to be coming back in the new year at some point to work through the whole letter to the Philippians. And so we will come back to this passage again, but uh, for this morning, we're going to think about this in the context of this cross-section in our church's life as we consider this passage together. See, with the, the milder weather outside, I wonder, you probably haven't even considered it, but I wonder what you think of as the perfect Christmas as you think about the weeks ahead, as you think about what awaits you on the 25th of December, what do you imagine will happen? Perhaps you imagine certain presents sitting under the tree as all the hints have paid off and your loved one has gotten you exactly the thing that you want and it's just sitting there waiting for you wrapped beautifully in Christmas morning. Perhaps the perfect Christmas that you want is one like one of those Sainsbury's or M&S adverts that are bombarded on our screens with the perfect turkey in the middle, with all the trimmings around the edges, with the perfect family sitting around the beautiful dinner table where nothing is burned and where everyone says how great the meal was and is on their best behavior. And you get all the compliments about how good your cooking was, how beautiful the spread was, how tidy the house is. Maybe that's your perfect Christmas, or, or maybe the perfect Christmas means that in the run-up, in the, in the carol services or the school carol service, every child in the choir, including your child, stands perfectly, and it leaves you filled with joy and laughter, just like they have in the Christmas movies, the Christmas adverts that we see all the time. But if you cast your mind back to past Christmases, has this been the reality? Has it lived up to that idea of the perfect Christmas you have in your head? I thought about this last night as I was struggling to put up a Christmas tree and get it straight and made a complete hames of it that meant that I threw it into the garage and we're going to try it again this afternoon. See, often we try and get this Christmas without success. Often the house is just a mess. Everyone is stressed. The tree sheds its pines all over the floor. The turkey is burned and everyone around the table wants you to know that it's burned. During the carol service, all the children are standing like angels apart from your child who has their finger up their nose and it's captured in the school video for everyone to see. The presents don't go down well. The monopoly causes an argument. Granny flips the table over. You get annoyed. You get irritated. You wonder, is this really all that it is? See, the reality of Christmas never seems to fulfill the hopes that we had for it. Maybe that's what's coming in the num next number of weeks. But what about the perfect church? What would you think that the perfect church looks like? Maybe it fits in with the kind of music that you like, whether it's old hymns played in the organ, whether it's newer songs, traditional or modern. Maybe you have preferences about the color of the carpet or, or the color of the walls, what the minister should wear, what programs we should have during the week and, and who should be involved. The list could go on and on and on. And I hope it isn't the case here, but I hear many Christians say that they become disillusioned with church because it doesn't fit with their image of the perfect church according to their preferences. See, as Paul writes here to the Philippian church, he's writing to a congregation that he holds dear to his heart, one that seems to be doing so many things right to the point that commentators have often called it the, the crown and glory church of Paul's ministry. If you remember back Acts 16, we're told about the first three converts in this church, and they're radically different. There's a Philippian jailer, there's Lydia, a rich woman, and then there's a slave girl. This is an incredibly diverse church made up of people who wouldn't normally engage with one another in their life from different backgrounds, different cultures, but now people who've been united by the gospel. And so Paul's desire for them is that they would live out what they, the reality of them has been, that they would be a church united together. 
See, Paul tells this diverse church that they're to live out their unity, and if they do, it would complete his joy as it would reflect the gospel. And we see that in verse 1, if you look there with me. It says there, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What Paul is saying here is all these things actually exist. There is encouragement in Christ. There is comfort in love. There is participation in the Spirit. There is affection and sympathy. And so they are to be united together with the same mind, the same love, and the full accord and of one mind and one spirit. See, this morning, while we are here from the same area, many of us are related to one another through family connections. We are different in terms of our ages, the generations we're a part of, the different life experiences we have, the different work experiences we have. We've all been brought together through this gospel of Jesus Christ. We are united together through our faith in him as a congregation of his people called to live out the reality of the gospel together in our relationships with one another. I mentioned at the service on, on Friday night that I served for a number of years in Sloan Street Presbyterian Church in Lisburn. It became our home church and our sending congregation. Uh, and when I started in that congregation, I quickly developed a friendship with possibly the most unlikely person in the congregation. He was one of the elders. His name was Jim. When, when I began in that church, I was 21 years old. And when I met Jim, he was 86. He was a widower. I wasn't yet married. I was a townie from Portrush. He was somebody who grew up in the Dramara Hills. He had worked all his life and was retired from his work as sales rep. I had only just come out of university, and this was my first role. There seems to have been no little or no common ground between the two of us, but yet our faith united us so much that as we went out for lunch every single month, that is what we talked about. We talked about how the gospel was at work in us and in those around us. See, as a congregation, we are united together by the gospel. And so Paul calls us here to reflect the reality that God has brought about among us. And this has application for us among older people and younger people that we can invest in one another. If you're younger here, why not go to someone who's older, who's been living the Christian life for longer and ask them how their faith came to be? How, what is their testimony? How have they walked with the Lord through all these years? Or if you're older, come alongside someone who's younger and encourage them in their faith. Invest in them because you have the gospel in common. But how? How, how can we do this? How can we really do it? Well, if you look with me, verses 3 and 4, it says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. See, how can we be united together? Well, it's by acting in humility towards one another. Can you imagine how this might have looked in, in the Philippian church with those three converts? Can you imagine the Philippian jailer who would have been imprisoning people in Philippi? Can you imagine him serving the slave girl? It's completely countercultural. Can you imagine Lydia who had made so much money through selling precious goods being called to give up that money to be generous to those around her. Isn't that how the gospel flips the expectations on their head as humility comes in? This is how we care for one another, how we're united to one another. What about for us? How do Paul's words impact our everyday lives as we're united to one another as Christians? How can we act with humility towards one another in everyday life? Well, it'll affect our conversations, won't it? We'll spend time listening to those around us, hearing their genuine concerns, and, and then trying to help them rather than trying to manipulate things and turn them into a different topic or a different outcome or turn the conversation back on ourselves again. It should affect how we view what we have as we look at our bank balance, as we give away our time and our energy as well, as we serve those who don't have as much as we have, or as we bless them or serve them. 
Maybe if you don't do it already, it means inviting somebody out for coffee or inviting them over for a dinner and a meal in your house or inviting them out into a restaurant, inviting them to be part of your life as you're united together, even those people you find it difficult to get on with. I'm sure there's not that many people here like that. See, this, this afternoon, we're going to follow this chapter as we actually see Paul's motivation for this unity through humility. We see Paul has this motivation, but yet he knows it at the same time that humbling himself is really, really difficult because we often feel that we need to pull back because of a wrong motivation, because we're wired because of our sin to turn in on ourselves. In Genesis 3, right from the very first temptation in the Garden of Eden, the, the serpent tells Eve that we can be like God. And part of that means that we then become the center of our own universes, meaning that we push God and others out into our far-off orbit. See, Paul sees our problem. He sees how difficult it is to humble ourselves as we relate and focus on others. He sees how it affects our unity together. How it, but then he points us to our motivation for this unity through humility. He points us to Jesus, the humble king. Do you see that in verse 2? Where he says, being of the same mind... But we're then told in verse 5 what that mind is. It's that mind which is yours in Christ Jesus. To show us what unity through humility looks like, Paul tells us about Jesus. He tells us about all that he came to do in this world through his incarnation, through his life, and through his death, and through his resurrection again. And so as we come to Paul's description, we're going to spend the rest of our time thinking about how Jesus helps us to live this out in our reality, in our lives. Because Paul tells us in these verses about Jesus, the one who had all things, then the one who gave all things, and now the one who has been given all things, who shares them with us. You see, Paul's passage gives us an amazing reminder of the one that we come to adore, especially at this time of year, this joy to the world that we will sing about over these weeks and that we will worship. So let's see what he says that he has at the beginning of verse 5. As we say that Jesus Christ had all things, if you look with me there, it says this, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped. See, what Paul does here is he pulls back the veil of time and he shows us the Son of God before the foundation of the world. The, the Christmas story doesn't begin, as we'll see so much in the next number of weeks, with an angel or coming, an angel coming to Mary or a baby born in Bethlehem. But it tells us that it begins in eternity with Jesus, who is God himself, equal to God, who does not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. See, for him, it's not something that needs to be achieved. Jesus himself is God. He has all things. Because he created all things from nothing, as we're going to see next week. He spoke everything into being. Nothing is made outside of him, and so all of it is his. He deserves every crown, every throne, every robe, as we talked about earlier with the boys and girls. But he doesn't just leave and abandon his creation. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He has all things. And this is amazing because, as we've said, from the Garden of Eden, it's our temptation to be like God, that twisting in on ourselves. It's the pull of our hearts to gain worship, to gain status for ourselves, to be at the center of our universes to look out for our own wants, our own needs, and our own desires. But Jesus alone, who is truly God, who should rightfully be at the center, who should rightfully be seated at the throne of heaven, ruling over th all things, gives up all things and comes into our world, who humbles himself. So you need to see that in verse 7, if you look with me there. It says that he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, from this throne of heaven being equal to God, having all things, Jesus humbles himself. We need to be careful when we read this translation because when it says that he emptied himself, that doesn't mean that Jesus loses any of his divinity. He is fully God and fully man. But it's better understood as we read here that he humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant. 
He lays aside his rights and his privileges to come into this world for us as a servant. I wonder what you picture when you think of the nativity scene that we're going to have littered around in the next number of weeks. See, I knew growing up that the nativity scenes I saw, well, they were, they were well lit, the stable was clean, the hay was perfectly placed around the manger, the animals were in their best behavior. Mary was calm and Joseph was put together, stood adoring the baby who had a halo around his head. See, it felt like the innkeeper just had a petting zoo out the back of his inn. But the reality of Christmas is so much different. The King of glory stepped from his heavenly throne and came into our world. Can you think of the distance between that, the distance from a a heavenly throne to an earthly manger? He couldn't really have gotten much lower. He was born to Mary and Joseph who knew that this baby was a child from God himself, but to those around it looked like they'd gotten pregnant outside of marriage, outside and broken their betrothal vows. Jesus wasn't born in a palace in Jerusalem, but he was born in a stable in an inn behind Bethlehem. It was dark and dank and smelled, would have noisy animals around it, be an infection hazard. But yet, just as as a famous carol says, low within a manger lies he who built the starry skies. He who throned in height sublime sits amid the cherubim. Sacred infant, all divine, what tender love is thine, thus to come from highest bliss down to such a world as this. Jesus is still fully God, but now we see he is the one who created everything but has come into this animal tray, dependent on his mother for food, for warmth, and for security. He takes up our human nature with all of our frailties and needs apart from sin. The one who deserved to be worshipped and served above all now takes the form of a servant. See, as you think about Christmas in these next number of weeks, don't sanitize it. Don't try and clean it up. Don't try and make it more acceptable because if we do, we miss so much of the muck and the grime of how far Jesus came from heaven to earth. We miss how he steps into our world, taking our humanity upon himself. See, at Christmas, we celebrate God's answer to our sin, Jesus Christ, who was made low. And is there a greater contrast from that throne to the manger? See, as I was preparing this, I thought about people who had given up such riches. I read story after story of people who had given up fortunes of three billion, seven billion, eight billion. They go from living in mansions to living in small rented houses. But yet, even by giving away billions, Well, it's like a drop in the ocean compared to what we have here in the Christmas story. What about you? How do you feel when you hear this? When you think about how Jesus left his throne in heaven, how he came into the humblest of circumstances, the the king of all became a servant. Well, so often our world can be divided over just a couple of miles to see somebody who's in need. That's too much, too big a barrier to handle. The Christmas story here, Paul tells us, is the challenge as we seek to live unified and humbly with one another. But as we remember Christmas in these next number of weeks, as we come into this Advent season, we remember it's not an end to itself. See, that contrast of heaven to the manger isn't as low as it goes because Jesus comes for a purpose. He comes from heaven to go to the cross for us. Paul tells us in verse 8, if you read with me there, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, even though he was innocent, Jesus endures the punishment that the guilty deserve. He steps all the way into our circumstances and bears the punishment that we deserve, and he dies in our place. The one who has given life to all gives his life for us. There is no greater contrast than this from heavenly throne to cross to garden tomb. See, the Christmas story points us forward to Easter and all that Jesus is coming into our world to do. But thankfully, we know that the story doesn't end there, that Jesus had all things, he gave all things, but now he has been given all things. And we see it in these verses that verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. See, that's Jesus' place right at the moment, in heaven beside Jesus shows us what it is like to be a servant and then to rise again and be exalted. The path to true glory, true honor is not found in going up as our world tells us, but is found in going down and serving one another. Jesus is the motivation for our service, for our unity to one another. So how does this passage change us this afternoon? As we focus on the one who's been given all things, we see how he accomplished it. We see that he has come into this world for us. We see that he has laid down his life for us. That he has forfeited his own rights and his own needs in order to serve us. It tells us that what the Christian life looks like, it's supposed to look like. Instead of seeking our own good, whether it's that better life, that perfect Christmas, even the perfect church, according to our own preferences. It tells us that our unity True unity comes through humility as we follow the example of Jesus. See, when we follow him more, we care more about what we give than what we receive. We care more about being a servant than serving, or than being served or being the center of attention. See, there are many things that we do well as a congregation. I know that already. And much of this that Paul talks about already goes on here. But perhaps we need to hear this again as we begin a new season of ministry, even in this Advent season, as we're going to be considering Jesus and his incarnation more and more. Maybe we need to stop and consider those who are around us in church life. Maybe we need to ask how God has equipped us to serve others around us. Whether it's to consider inviting someone out for a coffee, having that conversation, making someone a meal and delivering it, or inviting them to your home. But what's the motivation? It's because of what Christ has first done for us. And so as you think about Christmas, keep Christ and all he has done at the forefront of your mind. As you begin this new season of ministry, keep Christ and all that he has done at the forefront of your mind as as our example, our motivation for our unity and our humility. And so we will show others around us what the true gospel is like as we serve one another. Let us serve one another, seeing first the one who served us, the one who had all things, that heavenly throne, the one who gave all things and went to the cross and to the grave for us, now the one who has been given all things, who bestows them upon us. May this shape our lives, not only for this Advent season, not only for the beginning of this new ministry life, but our whole lives as individuals and as a congregation for Christ's glory. Let's pray as we respond to what we've heard. Father God, we praise you for all that this passage teaches to us. Lord, as we see this church that Paul had so much thankfulness for in Philippi that reminds us so much of all the good that goes on here. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed on us in our community together. But Lord, just as the church in Philippi needed to be reminded to be united together by being humble towards one another, let us hear the same message. Not because of our own strength, not because of our own ability, but because we can focus on your son, Jesus, who left the throne of heaven, who came into this world, who went to the cross and to the grave and who has risen again for us in our salvation. Lord, we pray that we would see him as our motivation as we engage with one another, as we seek to truly love one another and care for one another throughout all of life. Lord, help us to make this the motivation of our lives as individuals and also as a congregation so that the world around us may see the gospel that we hold dear and they may come to know you because you have first served us. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we bring our service to a close this afternoon. We're going to stand and, and respond to what we've heard as we think about how our motivation is not our own ability, but is through Christ in us. So let's stand as we sing, yet not I, but through Christ in me. <laughs>
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain on each one of us now and forevermore. Amen.